Amen. Amen. We are continuing on in our road trip, and we're coming to an important junction in Acts today. We're looking at Acts chapter 15, and the insert is in your bulletin, um, but if you brought your Bible, feel free to open that up. We're in Acts chapter 15, and this is a, a major um, turning point in the early church. I, I won't go in detail, but just over the past few weeks, we've learned what it was like how God was pouring out not only the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but the person and power of the Holy Spirit into people as they came to faith in God. Not only the beginning disciples that walked with Jesus, but people from far off, people that came into Jerusalem, they heard about Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit in their own language, and they went off and back into their communities and shared the gospel of Jesus. And, and the gospel spread into Samaria, and people were converted and baptized and filled with the Spirit. It spread to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and back to Ethiopia through him. It spread to non-Jewish background people. Um, it started to spread to a group called the Gentiles, or the nations, other than the Jewish nation. And it spread through uh, Cornelius. And then we see Paul and Barnabas was able to share about Jesus to the people that were from Cyprus that had no Jewish background at all. And they were receiving Jesus Christ into their life as their Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit was filling them and helping them to live out the life that God has called them to in relationship with him. And so all of these good things were happening. But there was a problem. And the problem that was existing was there was a group of people that came to faith in Jesus Christ, but they had been Jews all, all the way back in their history. And that was a major part of their identity. And they were mixing together with this new group of people that were becoming Christians based on faith in Jesus Christ and, the, and, and seeking uh, Jesus as the forgiveness of their sins and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were Christians as well. But there was this struggle between these two groups. And we're going to read about that today in Acts chapter 15. And it's not a small struggle, please. Let's, let's see what was happening. So in Acts chapter 15, starting right off in verse 1, here's what it says. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, or those gathered together, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after they had been, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. As all the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating to what the signs and wonders God had done uh, uh, through them among the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about the taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and that all the Gentiles 
who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them and that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from that which is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men among them uh, to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabas, and Silas, leading them among the brethren. And then they sent this letter by them. And the letter's written there. I'm just going to jump down to verse 30. It says this. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch. And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. And after they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also. The word of the Lord. As we go through this um, passage, we are learning what it's like to, to deal with... Um, a conflict. And, and there was a, a very serious conflict. There was, issue, there was an issue that was arising there where this group of Jewish believers just could not see how faith in Jesus Christ could come without all of the traditions that they had grown up with. And all of these traditions that had been laid out in the law, that had been given in the scriptures, that had been given in the Talmud, that had been given in the, in the early works of, of, of God, the laws of Moses laid out before them. And so what do we do? So hopefully as we hear what the early church did, hopefully this will help you as well in your own life, not just in spiritual matters, but also in how you deal with uh, conflicts and, and the right way of dealing with it. So we see at the beginning, at the first, we see in Acts chapter uh, 15 and verse 1, there was uh, Christians getting mixed messages. Some men, they, some men came down from Judea, and they began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. For those of you that have walked with the Lord for any period of time, I am sure that you have encountered other Christians that are telling you, oh, you need to do things this way. Oh, you don't do things this way? This is how you're supposed to live. I think we've all encountered that. People have told us, you know, well, you're living one way. Well, here's another way that you should be living. And I think it's extremely important for us when we get questions like this, when we have people saying things like this, to not automatically become defensive and angry, but to begin to work it through. Here's what we see what happens in, in Acts. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 2, as these people from Judea were come down, coming down and saying this, the local pastors, Paul and Barnabas, they, they had a bit of a, a debate and they had some dissension with these folks coming from Judea. That's what it says, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them because it caused tension within the leaders. One leader is saying, you need to do this, and then these guest speakers from Judea are coming and they're saying, you need to do this. And so back and forth, People were going, well, who do I believe? Who do I listen to? What, what's the right way? And so here's how they came up with the solution. The brethren, which is the group, the congregation together, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. They decided, let's take this issue up to an overseeing body. I think I mentioned before that when the early church formed, God poured out his power through his Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And then they tried, then as the message of Jesus was spreading, the, um, the, the Jewish groups were saying, no, we don't want people to believe Jesus is the Messiah. This is not true. This is a lie. And they tried to crush the message of the gospel. And as they did, the church scattered but the apostles, for the most part, hung out in Jerusalem, and they found a place uh, tucked away where they were able to, to still kind of be the, um, uh, the, the key point people. These are people that walked with Jesus, that saw Jesus die, buried, and resurrected. So these are the, 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 the eyewitness account people, the apostles, the disciples, and as well, 
Amongst them were others that came to faith in Jesus because of their message. So there was a bit of a core that existed in Jerusalem. And so this church that's hearing these mixed messages, you must follow the laws of Moses. No, you don't need to. Well, what do we do? Well, let's send a delegation to Jerusalem to find out. Let's, let's send a group up there. And when they did that, we see that um, that is the way that they thought together, let's work out a solution. Let's figure out what we're supposed to do. And this is what it says. So they sent, therefore being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were, bring, and were bringing great joy to the brethren. One of the things I, I want to remind you is that the word of God is written from historical truths as well and geographic places. I know I've talked about that a few times before, but the names of places are places that exist today. You know, and as these people were making their way from Antioch and they were making their way up to Jerusalem, they physically went through a couple of, of areas. So for you and I, nowadays, we hop in a car and we can cover 100 kilometers in various amounts of time depending upon how heavy your foot is, right? We can, we can get from place to place really quickly. And if it's a very long distance, we can hop on a plane and we can cross halfway around the world in a day. It's amazing what we can cover. But in these days, people went by foot and they went slowly. And so as these people were making their way from this church that was having a dispute, not quite sure what to do, they were making their way through caravanning through, going through these country areas. They were going through Samaria and they're going through Phoenicia. And as they were going through these areas, as they drove, uh, drove by, as they went by, rode by places and walked by places, they would share stories about these places they're going through. As Paul and Barnabas are going through, they're explaining to this church in Antioch, oh, here's Phoenicia. Here's where this person came to faith in Christ. Here's where this person was baptized. Oh, look, we're going through Samaria. Remember here, this is where this person came to faith in Jesus. And this is how, how these people are still following God. And look, there's a little church over there from folks that have come to faith in Christ as they're making their way back through these areas. Paul and Barnabas are telling the folks from this church, Here's the proof as we're going through. Here's the proof. You see that? You see that? You see that? And so by the time they made it back to Jerusalem, they had all the information that, um, that, that they needed. So they come to Jerusalem, and this is often called the Jerusalem Council. And this is kind of the four, this is the first time that all of the disciples and all of the folks are coming together and making a huge decision. What do we do about this issue? Okay. And so as they gather together, here's what we see. They were coming in, and as they were coming in, I can still see Paul and Barnabas with the crowd coming in, and they came in and they said this. When they reported all that God had done with them. They were reporting all the miracles and all the great things that had happened about how God was reaching out to this group of people that he formerly didn't reach out to in the same way. These, these non-Jews. And he was sharing with them about Jesus and how their lives had been changed and transformed. And they were reporting all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, some of the, of the strong Jewish-backed believers... Uh, who had believed, stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So they come to the council, and there's still this issue is right there. It wasn't resolved. They had to come and figure this out. How many of you enjoy conflict? How many of you love conflict? None of us, right? This is typically, unfortunately, how we view conflict. There is just two sides, they're going at it, and the stronger one, or the most stubborn one, or the one that uh, has the most persuasive argument, whatever the case is, one is going to win. Because in every conflict, there is the potential to believe that you're going into it, and you're right. And the other person going into it is 
wrong. And the other person believes they're right. And they believe you're wrong. Right? And this can happen in uh, the most intimate of relationships, and it can happen in the loosest of relationships. It can, it can be political parties. It can be sports teams. It can be views on parenting. It can be all kinds of different things. You, you name something that could create conflict, and you're automatically going to have two opinions. But you don't necessarily need to have two sides. Can I share that with you? Here's, uh, here's a model. This is the best model that I, I can use to, to help describe um, how to deal with conflict. Imagine the conflict is here at the top of that triangle. That's, that's the issue. That's the problem, right? And then there's two groups that are trying, or two individuals that are trying to figure out what to do. Rather than letting the, that problem or crisis come in between the two parties, instead, think of it as a triangle. And think of it as together, how can we attack this problem, right? Instead of letting the problem divide people and creating sides and creating I'm right, you're wrong, instead of that, what if, what if we could have the problem being at the top and then the two people together working to see how can we together attack this problem? This is vital. If someone has ever had to deal with an addiction, the best way to help someone with the addiction is not to hold on to the addiction. You're attacking me. You're attacking what I'm doing. No, let's try and let go of it and place it here. And then together, let's approach this addiction. When it's finances, oh, well, no, we, you know, it's I'm a spender and you're a saver and that's just the way it is. No, well, what if... How if we attack the budget together? Here is the problem. Here is the situation. How do we together attack this? And so that all the energy goes into working together against the problem. Because what the enemy wants is to have you own the situation. And it's so important that you're right. right. And so that you will win the battle and lose the war. When actually a conflict can be the most unifying thing between two groups that came at it from opposing viewpoints. It is possible, and we see it here in Scripture. So they, we were told, if you want to read on, you certainly can in Acts 6, that they took a while. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 6. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, so you see this? They got together and they talked about it and they worked through and they debated back and forth. I think you sh we should approach it this way. I think we should approach it this way. But it was never the I'm right, you're wrong, you're terrible. Um, it's so easy to polarize an enemy, someone, just because they have a different view than you. That, that's not what's happening. But after they had debated back and forth, after they had talked back and forth, they recognized that since they were a family of believers, they had to work this out for the benefit of the family. The importance of family and the importance of unity is more important than this issue. So how do we work through even our strongly held views on this issue? So if any of you have ever watched a court scene on TV, some of you may have seen a court scene live and Sorry about that if you ever have had to have done that. But if you see a courtroom um, on TV, what I've learned, first of all, is I would never be a good lawyer. Um, but what I've learned also is that there's often opening statements and opening remarks. So what I'd like you to do is to look at this Council of Jerusalem kind of as being in a courtroom. Okay? And here's the first thing that we see. Peter gets up, and he does the opening remarks. And Peter goes through, and he shares some different things we see in verses 7 through 11. I've just picked up the highlights of what Peter's saying in his opening remarks. Here, in summary, is what he's saying. He's saying that God testified to these Gentiles, these non-Jewish believers, that became believers in Jesus Christ, 
God testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit. God has not withheld himself from these Gentiles. We can't say that they're not saved because they don't have the mark of Moses. God himself has placed his Holy Spirit within them. That's the first thing Peter says. And then Peter goes on to say, Why should we place upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? To translate that over a little bit, what he's saying is that God has laid out the law to show us how much we need him. And in the Old Testament, there was this sacrificial system that was set up to show that, that since we are not matching up to what God has asked us to do, nor will we ever, what sacrifice is necessary in order for us to be in right standing with God. And there was never a sacrifice that was good enough until Jesus Christ came, and by his death, burial, and resurrection, he became the sacrifice once for all. So why are we making these disciples, these new Christians that don't come from a Jewish background, why are we giving them all the baggage from our Jewish background? Why are we making them do all these things that we really couldn't accomplish on our own anyway? Our fathers couldn't do it, we can't do it. And then he summarized it all by saying this, that we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the same way as they are also. He boils it down to salvation is not based on having done those things of Moses, having followed any of those laws. That's not what salvation is based upon. Salvation is based upon Jesus fulfilling the law of Moses completely in his death, burial, and resurrection and adopting us into that through him. We claim his righteousness, not our own personal righteousness. So this is how he opens it up. He goes, basically, they have the Holy Spirit. Why are we trying to give them the baggage that we can't even live up to? And aren't they saved like we are through grace in Jesus Christ? That's a pretty convincing opening statement. But I want you to see this. Peter just didn't speak, and then everybody just went, yep, okay, done. No. They continued on because they did due diligence. They took time. The next thing we see is that after Peter had made his case, then we see the witnesses testifying. Right? These are witnesses that can testify to what Peter has just said. This is Paul and Barnabas. Right? Peter is in a whole different district. Now Paul and Barnabas that were in another area of the world. They're coming back, and all the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were uh, relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So as this group is gathering together to go, what do we do, what do we do? I hear what Peter has said. Yep, that makes sense. Now let's listen to Paul and Barnabas. And working, these are the ones that are in the trenches, working with the non-Jewish Christians. What do they have to say? Oh, there's amazing signs and wonders that God is doing through his Holy Spirit. There's miracles that are happening. There is, there is, there's baptisms. There's salvation. There's growth. There's a desire for God in their lives. They could even relate to the, the times that the non-Jewish Christians were giving money to care for the Jewish-backed Christians because of an upcoming famine. We talked about that last week. These are miraculous things for groups that don't normally get along together. This is what's happening. And so the witnesses testify. And then after the witnesses testify, then we have a third person speak. We don't hear much about this guy. This is James. I understand it to be the brother of Jesus who had a little bit of authority in the early church, quite a bit of authority. Some say that he was kind of the final word, even though Peter was declared the one on whom the church would be built. James was also one of those guys that you just wanted to hear. Have you guys ever been in a meeting somewhere and you've said, well, I don't know what I think. I'm going to wait till so-and-so speaks. Because when so-and-so speaks, they have a really good way of clarifying things. You ever have that? This is kind of the James in the early council. James was kind of that one that they wanted his opinion. So James gives the closing remarks. And James says, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Here's what it says in other versions. Let's not make it difficult for the new Christians. Let's keep it simple 
for the new Christians. Let's not make it difficult and overbearing upon them. As I live out my Christian life, there are things that I do and I don't do, not because my salvation hangs in the balance of whether I do them or I don't do them. There's some things that I do because I have freedom and I know I have a choice in it. And there's other things that I don't do that I have a freedom to do according to the gospel, but for a greater benefit or for another reason, I choose not to. For me to place on someone else to say, your salvation hangs in the balance unless you live exactly the way I'm telling you to live, exactly the way I live, exactly the way I've been brought up to understand the faith. If I dare tell someone that their salvation hangs in the balance of that, if it's Jesus plus anything, that's heresy. That's the truth. If you believe that your Christian faith is based upon Jesus plus anything, that's a lie. And this is what clearly, gently, quietly, but powerfully, the case was being made out to that council of people that came from Jewish backgrounds and those that um, did not come from Jewish backgrounds. And this is the conversation. I will tell you this. The majority of the people in that room came from a Jewish background. The vast majority of the people in that room came from a, a Jewish background. Where they would have followed, on average, 660 plus laws that affected every aspect of their life. This is how they grew up. They grew up almost robotic. Do I do this? Do I do this? Yes? No. Check with the judge. What does the book say? How do I? Whatever. And these are folks that have been ingrained in a certain way of living. Here's what James is saying. Okay, this is the way we've grown up. This is the way we've lived. But there's a group of people that haven't lived our way, that haven't grown up our way. And we need to not make it difficult for them. Because we can't even live the way we say we're supposed to live. <laughs> we need Jesus in order to, to live, in order to be saved. And so that's what they need too. But it doesn't end there. I want you to see this. Because the goal is not to say, you're saved, and you're saved, and we're all happy. No. The goal is to say, how do we live together as a family? How do we live together under God as a family? How do Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians live together as a family? And here's what he says. He goes through and he says, we will just give them four things. Right? These are the four things, write to them, that they are to do. That they are to abstain from. That's to stop or to avoid. Stop or avoid things contaminated by idols from fornication sleeping around, there's the modern version of it, from what is strangled and from blood. Now, as we read this today, we're like, okay. But in this day, I want you to see this. Like, in this day, there are multiple shrines set up. We live in a fairly secular society in Canada. I'd love to say we're a Christian society. And it's great that in the midst of crisis, people say, asking for prayers and we're praying for you. But on the most part in their daily lives, they are not folks that are seeking after God or a God. In this time, there was. The Romans were gods. The Egyptians were gods. There was, there was a God on every corner. And to them, they wanted the early Christians, the non-Jewish Christians, who didn't know about all this stuff about idolatry, they wanted them to know you need to avoid this stuff. Right? You can't come in and worship Jesus and also have your little um, idol from uh, the Egyptian temple. Right? Jesus is not one that's equal with the others. You are to avoid from things that are contaminated by idols. Basically, it's Jesus only, so keep it Jesus only, okay? And then the next thing, from fornication. It's, it's uh, fairly clear in Jewish law that there are very clear um, ways that you are to live and to handle your body sexually, how it is to be 
how, how, how you are to live that way, how, how you are to be, um, how you, you are to be chaste, and, and then when you are married, then you are to uh, have that intimacy with your wife, and that's it. No relationships beyond that. And this is what um, the scriptures here say as well, to tell the Gentiles, in case you haven't heard it, because I know a lot of you folks don't have a problem with sleeping around. And for some of them, it was like blowing your nose. It's like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Sounds like our society today, doesn't it? Oh, it's not a big deal. It's just sex. It's not a big deal. It's a big deal. And so they wanted to make sure that the people that didn't come from a Jewish background knew that this is a big deal to avoid this because it affects everything. It really does. To avoid what is strangled, again, that has something to do with in the time of, of sacrifices, there would be strangled offerings left before altars and from blood. Now, this is, unless you're Scottish and you like blood pudding, we don't necessarily deal with this much nowadays. But there was a time when people would drink blood like they would water or they would wine at special events to signify that this is, a, this is a victory toast and we drink the blood of something for this. The huge thing that's for this is, first of all, blood is tied so closely to life and especially from people from a Jewish background. They understand the importance of blood through the whole sacrificial system. And they understand the importance of Jesus' blood. Right? When we gather together and we celebrate communion, we remember that Jesus' body was broken and that his blood was shed. And we are welcomed into his family by Jesus' shed blood. And so for people to be celebrating communion once a month or once a day or once a week, whatever their thing was, but then also be drinking blood on the other side, it's like you're diluting the whole thing of what Jesus has done. You got that? So for Jews living with non-Jews, these were huge issues. A Jew sitting beside someone that was doing that would drive them nuts. But I do want you to see this. All of the things that the Jews were willing to give up, they gave up circumcision. That is something that had been done for hundreds of years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that... Here's something sad to share with you. We're working through something. Uh, we're trying to work through with some leadership amongst our denomination to find a way to help folks that are called into ministry to not to have to go through eight years of schooling before they can be ordained. We're trying to work through a way so that if somebody at 35 is sensing a call to ministry, that they don't have to be 43 before they're eligible to become a reverend. We're trying to work through that. Do you know one of the main th issues that we're hitting? We're hitting pastors, and we're saying, what do you think? And guess what they're saying? I had to jump through the hoops. I had to go through eight years. If I had to go through it, it's not fair that they don't have to. You know that? This is the mindset that can easily exist. All these youths. I had to be circumcised. I had to do this. I had to do that. They should have to, too, because I had to. You miss the whole message of the gospel when you make people have to do things because you have. And actually what you're doing is out of spite. It's not out of love. It's out of, well, I had to, so they have to. They were willing to give up a lot of those things. These things here, though, these things they thought were vitally important and need to be taught in the churches and to be proclaimed. So that's what happened. It follows a principle that we see in Romans chapter 14 and we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And basically, in summary of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, as Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, he says, if food causes my brother to stumble, then I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. There is a principle that exists that says if for somebody, if they really find a food offensive, the loving thing for the other person to do is to not eat that food with them or, or uh, make them uncomfortable by making them, inviting them over for a pig roast if they are opposed to pork. You don't have to do that. For the person that is growing up in the Jewish background and becomes a believer in Christ, they might still follow a lot of those things that they follow from their Jewish tradition. They're not bad. They're laws that God has laid out. They're not bad. They're not going to be saved by following them. But a lot of things that God has laid out in his laws are pretty good, right? 
There's a lot of really good... If you ate the way that they say in the Old Testament to eat, you'd have a pretty healthy diet, right? We'd have a whole lot less disease than the way it was laid out. It doesn't save you, and I think that was the problem that they were running into. It's not a matter of saving, but if it's a matter of choice and it's a matter of conviction or the big word conscience, then let's honor. Let's honor folks that have different backgrounds and different views, and let's come together and focus on Jesus. So what happened is that they got together, the, the council, the elders, the apostles, the disciples, they all gathered together. They heard what Peter said. They heard what Paul and um, Barnabas had said. They heard what James had said. And they gathered and they crafted this letter, the first letter to come out from the council, and they sent it back to the church. And they didn't send it back to the church just with Paul and Barnabas. They sent it back to the church with a group of people so that Paul and Barnabas can't go back and say, yeah, they said our side's right. No, they sent back a whole group so that there was witnesses to say, here's exactly what the council said, and what they're saying is true, and here's a letter to prove to it. And here's what happened when that letter was read. When they were sent down, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. These people that were non-Jewish automatically were like, oh, we don't have to follow all the Jewish laws. That is so wonderful. That is so great. They, we could have had to do a whole lot of things, but the freedom that we have in that, and they gladly accepted the four things that they were told to avoid. They accepted those gladly, absolutely, because it's been resolved. And what happened is these two groups that could have been really nasty, it could have been the first major church split. Instead of that happening, they chose to come together and attack the problem together, and then they found a resolution that both could live with. And from this place forward, we exist as a church today because this, this council in Jerusalem was able to find a way for the Christian faith to survive and thrive in a non-Jewish background. Praise God for that. So for each one of you, as there are conflicts that will arise in life that are serious, that are things that you have held on to and think are extremely important and you want to fight for, just remember family and the relationship that you're working on is more important than the issue, right? So keep the issue out there, and as family, as friends, as loving your neighbor, as you're able to work it through, work it through and, and pray, 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 right? Rather than trying to win, pray. You got that? And then when, when that happens, God pours out unity and peace and encouragement and power. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that in the midst of conflict, you are there and that you offer us a way. In every trial, you provide for us a way. So Lord, we seek you. We seek you for those trials in our lives. We seek you, Lord, when we have different views of what it means to follow you and how others seek to push that upon us. And Lord, we seek to know what it is that you are guiding us in. We thank you that we are saved by Jesus and nothing else that we do. Thank you that it is never Jesus plus. Thank you that it is Jesus and the completed work that he has done that has led to our salvation. And Father, we are open to you and to your spirit and to the guidance of fellow Christians and others of how we can live flourishing in that Christian life. So Lord, we thank you for people that come alongside to encourage and to advise and to counsel. Lord, we thank you for their words. And, and as we take them in, we honor and respect people that come from different approaches and different ways and how they live out their Christian life and how it flourishes for them. Lord, we are grateful. And Lord, if we are to learn from them and to model them, show us how. And if we are to live the way that you have called us distinctly, thank you, God. Thank you for that as well. But we seek you in all things. Lord, we pray that there would be no conflict that would cause division amongst us and those that we love. And Lord, help us to love those that have different views as much as we love those that have the same views as we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
He's enough. He's it. That's where your salvation is found, in Jesus, through Jesus. That's enough. There's lots of things we can do to flourish in our Christian walk, but your salvation is through Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Help us to always be grateful. Help us to always come back to you when we have a question of our faith and we have a question of how we practice it. Lord, help us to come back to you through Jesus Christ to see all that you have done and all that you will do through us, your church. Father, direct us this week. Show us where we need to be light in darkness. Fill us with your spirit so we have your light to share. And all of God's people said,